In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. Please be seated. Welcome to this solemn pontifical funeral mass for Cardinal Edward Idris Cassidy, companion of the Order of Australia, President Emeritus of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, President Emeritus of the Commission of the Holy See, for religious relations with the Jews, and Sostituto Emeritus of the Secretary, Secretariat of State. Born in 1924, he studied in the Springwood and Manly seminaries and was ordained priest in this cathedral church 72 years ago. Fellow seminarian Edward Bede Clancy was ordained beside him. The Archbishop presiding was Norman Thomas Gilroy. The pastor of St. Francis Parish Haymarket, Monsignor James Darcy Freeman, was present with the other Sydney clergy, and the remains of Patrick Francis Moran lay beneath them. By a quirk of fate, five of Australia's seven cardinals so far were together that day with only Cardinals Knox and Pell absent. Of all his exotic assignments, surely the strangest was to deepest, darkest Wagga Wagga, where he did ordinary priest's work. But after only a few years, his intelligence and charm had marked him out for other tasks, and he was sent to Rome in 1952 to undertake a doctorate in canon law and a Diploma in Diplomatic Studies at the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy. His fate was then sealed. He was delegated to the Apostolic Nunciatures of India, then Ireland, El Salvador and Argentina. Ordained Bishop in 1970, he was then appointed in turn as Apostolic Pronuncio to Taiwan, then to Bangladesh and Burma, to Lesotho and South Africa, and finally to the Netherlands. Then he began his high task in the Curia, which made him the highest ranking Australian churchman up to that time. He was created Cardinal by St John Paul II in 1991. His work in ecumenism and interfaith relations, especially with our Jewish brothers and sisters, is widely recognised. Only last week, at a meeting of the religious leaders of this region, I heard from Protestant and Jewish leaders what a friend he was to them all. The Bible promises three score years and ten, or four for those who are strong. But his eminence nearly got to five score, living and serving under nine popes, and long demonstrating a virility and fitness unusual in one so old. He finally went to God within the eight day long feast of Easter. A man of immense charm and intellect, of deep faith in Christ and fidelity to the church, he was a great encourager. As a young bishop, I certainly received that from him myself. I acknowledge His Excellency the Apostolic Nuncio to Australia, the Most Reverend Adolfo Tito Ilana, who will preside at today's funeral mass. The Most Reverend Mark Coleridge, President of the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference. The Most Reverend Brian Mascord, Bishop of Wollongong, who will preach the homily. Several more bishops from around Australia and many brother priests. I especially welcome members of the Cassidy Tracy, Gold and Lenson families, Paul Tracy, his executor, and Sister Kath Williams, who long cared for him. 
I salute Mr. Kandher Masudul Alam, the Consul General of Bangladesh, where Cardinal Cassidy served when it was a brand new country, and other members of the diplomatic and consular corps. I recognize the members of the Order of Malta, the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Orders of Ecclesiastical Honours present, leaders or representatives of various church agencies and other dignitaries. My friend, Mr. Jeremy Jones of the Australian, Australia and Israel Jewish Affairs Council is one of those here representing the Jewish community. It's a tribute to the Cardinal and to the friendship between our two faith traditions that rather than a Catholic hierarch, this Jewish leader penned today's obituary in The Australian. Mr. Jones wrote that the Car Cardinal Casti's leg legacy included not just the hearts he touched and the minds he changed, but the foundations he built for understanding and collaboration between all peoples for the good of humanity. May his memory always be a blessing. In 2002, when Cardinal Cassidy retired after 52 years of active ministry, St. John Paul II wrote to him with these words. I do not wish to let you go without acknowledging my profound personal gratitude to you for your exemplary priestly life and in particular for the wonderful help you have given me during the years of my pontificate. I wish to thank you for all you have achieved, not without great self-sacrifice, as a trusted partner in dialogue with the other Christian churches and ecclesial communities, as well as in the excellent work you have done in building relations between the Catholic Church and Judaism. How many other graces has the Lord granted his church through your constant and effective cooperation? My gratitude to you is both heartfelt and abiding. Now that you are returning to your place of birth, which you have always deeply loved and of which you are an admirable ambassador, you will often be in my prayers, just as I commend myself and my ministry to yours. Echoing those words of praise and their promise of prayer, we now commend this faithful Christian soul, priest, bishop and cardinal, to that Lord whom he serves so well and ask that he be granted eternal life in the everlasting Easter of heaven. I now invite Archbishop Ilana, representing the Holy Father Pope Francis, to conduct our solemn pontifical mass of Christian burial. I read now the message of His Holiness Pope Francis on the passing of His Eminence Edward Cardinal Idris Cassidy. After that, also the message of Cardinal Pietro Parolin, Secretary of State, and lastly, from His Excellency Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher, Secretary for the Relations with the States. The first message. Having learned with sadness of the death of Cardinal Edward Idris Cassidy, I offer my heartfelt condolences, recalling with gratitude the late Cardinal's years of valued service to the Holy See, his zeal for the spread of the gospel, and his commitment to the promotion of Christian unity. I commend his noble soul to the merciful love of God, our Heavenly Father. To all who mourn Cardinal Cassidy in the sure hope of the resurrection, I cordially impart my apostolic blessing 
as a pledge of consolation and peace in the Lord. Signed, Franciscus Papa. Please accept my condolences at the passing of Cardinal Cassidy and the assurance of my prayers that the gracious Lord will grant him the reward of his faith in his labors for the church. Signed, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, Secretary of State. To these two messages, His Excellency Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher, Secretary for the Relations with the States, expresses also personally his condolences to the living relatives and to the entire Catholic community in Australia at the loss of an exemplary servant of the church who dedicated his whole life serving Christ and the church. Let's all stand. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I pray and receive in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done, in what I have failed to do, through my fall, through my fall, through my most grievous fall. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who chose your servant, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, from among your priests and endowed him with pontifical dignity in the apostolic priesthood, grant, we pray, that he may also be admitted to their company forever. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. On this mountain, he will remove the morning veil covering all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every cheek he will take away his people's shame everywhere on earth. For the Lord has said so. That day it will be said, See, this is our God, in whom we hoped for salvation. The Lord is the one in whom we hoped. We exult and we rejoice that he has saved us. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. The life and death of each of us has its influence on others. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So that alive or dead, we belong to the Lord. This explains why Christ both died and came to life. It was so that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. This is also why you should never pass judgment on a brother or treat him with contempt. We shall all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. As scripture says, by my life, it is the Lord who speaks. Every knee shall bend before me, and every tongue shall praise God. It is to God, therefore, that each of us must give an account of himself. The word of the Lord. On the first day of the week, two of the disciples were on their way to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking together about all that had happened. Now as they talked this over, Jesus himself came up and walked by their side. But something prevented them from recognizing him. He said to them, what matters are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces downcast. Then one of them, called Cleophas, answered him, You must be the only person staying in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have been happening there these last few days. What things, he asked, all about Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, who proved he was a great prophet by the things he said and did in the sight of God and of the whole people, and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and had him crucified. Our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And this is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it all happened. And some women from our group have astounded us. 
they went to the tomb in the early morning, and when they, and they did not find the body, they came back to tell us they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb and found everything exactly as the woman had reported. But of him, they saw nothing. Then he said to them, you foolish men, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scripture that were about himself. When they draw near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. And the eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he had vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They set out that instant and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 assembled together with their companions who said to them, yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told the story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized him at the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When we think of Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, or Idris Edward Cardinal Cassidy, or Bill, or Uncle Bill, or Eminence, whatever name you may have known him by, I can't help but think of the statement that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Mind you, he would never have seen himself as someone on whose shoulders we stood, because that was his humility. What you saw was what you got. I believe a humble, gentle man who simply lived the experience of God present to him, no matter what the situation. When Joseph Cardinal Bernardine, the former Archbishop of Chicago died, there was great sadness in the community because in all that he did in his life, he did for the building up of the kingdom and helping people recognize that they were profoundly loved by God. I believe this was the case for Cardinal Cassidy also. This is what he did for us over the years whilst a priest, a member of the diplomatic corps and at the highest levels of our church. 
This is who Cardinal Cassidy was for us who knew him and were loved by him. There were also many complexities to the man. He could be very intense and he could be very quite laid back. But no matter how you found him, he always seemed to be present to you. I can't help but think that he lived in many ways the part of the rule of St. Benedict, where it says that all guests should be received as Christ. A number of years ago in the tablet magazine, there was a definition given of what a pilgrim was. It simply said that a pilgrim accepts life as an unfolding gift. It is not a pilgrim is not deterred by failure and disappointments. Pilgrim sees these experiences as opportunities for spiritual growth. And a pilgrim never feels comfortable or at ease with society's values. A pilgrim will live, will live by and live in faith. And a pilgrim puts himself at the hand of God, thus opening themselves to God. And a pilgrim celebrates the moment and is thus able to live life to the full. I believe pilgrim is the title that we can give to Cardinal Cassidy. He was a pilgrim, a man of faith, of hope, and of charity. He welcomed people and cared for people. This is how he expressed his love of God. That's why the readings that we listen to today are so important, because they tell us how to live, how to love, and how to follow Christ. This is what the Cardinal has taught us. It was not by gathering us at the foot of a mountain and talking to us, but rather by him walking alongside us, listening to us, and recognizing the relationship that we had with God and he sharing the relationship and showing us how to live it. He taught by the example of his own faithfulness and he invited us into a relationship with God never dictating how it should be, but rather allowing us to develop our own. In these readings that we've listened to today, we are confronted with so many images. And sometimes when we hear a sermon, our reaction can be, what would he know? If only he knew the complexities of my life, he would soon change his tune. The reason the Cardinal could preach the way he preached was because he knew suffering. He struggled with his own pain and his own belief in himself. But he never doubted the presence and the love of his God. He was sensitive to the human frailties of the congregation that was before him, no matter whether that was the top echelons of our church or within the Italian community at Broadmeadow in Newcastle. He shared others' pain because he knew his own. This sense of being a pilgrim that I mentioned a little earlier gives us a context for the gospel reading that we have listened to. So let us put ourselves into the position of the disciples who walked away from Jerusalem. As they walked along, what did they encounter and who did they encounter? As they walked the road, they are doing what all good Jews would do. They echo the Lord's command in the Deuteronomy of the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. They would have been talking about the events and the experiences of the presence of God in their midst as they walked along, trying to make sense of it all and unable to do so. They encounter Jesus. 
He listens to their expectations, their hopes, and their disappointments. It is in this reality that Christ opens up for them the experience of God's presence that they are unable to see. Through this, he enables the disciples to see through their disillusionment and, so to speak, join the dots. And they make the connection between what they are going through and with the whole reality of salvation. They are now seeing a new hope. Yes, things are different. However, they still cannot recognize the Christ. And only when they come to the ordinary experience of praying the blessing over bread and breaking it to share, do they get it. Everything now makes sense to them. And they are impelled to go back to Jerusalem and share the experience. Today, as we gather to pray for the Cardinal, our journey of faith, our road to Emmaus is put before us. There is no point in our coming here today and pretending to be different from how we actually feel and who we are. God sees our hearts and our minds and wants to meet us in the midst of our lives, whatever that may be like. The Emmaus story teaches us that Christ firstly wants to listen to us before he wants us to listen to him. In many ways, Emmaus was not just about the disciples in their lives, in the same way that when we celebrate the Eucharist, it's not just about our lives either. Christ meets us here today, opens the scriptures to us so that we can make sense of our experience and see the ways in which God is present and absent and help us recognize the foolishness of our own expectations. This is why the Mass and the Eucharist was so important for the Cardinal, because it was here that he continually encountered Jesus, but it was also in the encounter with others and the sharing with others that he came to understand the link between the personal relationship with God that is always expressed through the community gathered. As with the Emmaus disciples, we are welcome to the table of the Lord where we recognize Christ in the breaking of bread and the pouring of the cup, which commands us to go out from here and proclaim to all we meet that Christ is risen. As we've heard in Deuteronomy, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Since my first getting to know the Cardinal, I've learnt very quickly how important the sacraments were to him and how unworthy he felt in both receiving them and celebrating them. But they were his life. And he always did the best he could. In his way, he held up to people an experience of hope. He walked in a long line of faithful people who along the way encountered disappointment and disillusionment. But when he discovered the Christ of Emmaus, he made sure that there was hope for others and he led them to know the Christ of Emmaus also. Many of us here would only have ever met the serious side of Bill Cassidy through our encounters with him at an official church level. But there was another side of him also. The only way to describe him was the playful side. I first met Cardinal Cassidy when I was a young teacher in the Diocese of Maitland, Newcastle through the Tracy family. Then later as a seminarian and the rest is history. On a visit to Taree with Ron and Norma they were traveling up to the Gold Coast for holidays. Norma and Ron and Bill stayed with Brian Bailey and myself at Taree Presbytery for a night. I'd hidden a bottle of scotch that had been given to me as a gift right at the back of the cupboard that I thought was out of sight. 
out of mind, out of reach. When I went to the lounge room, here was Cardinal Cassidy sitting up there with a very large glass of scotch, relaxing, with a great smirk on his face. When I asked him how he found it, he simply looked at me, smiled, touched his nose and said, I can sniff it out. That began for all of us a night of wonderful laughing and sharing. This was the human side that I came to know and care about over the next almost four decades. I think it set the scene for how we were to interact with one another over the years. But there are also the memories of Bill the priest, the man of prayer, who constantly prayed his rosary and his breviary, who sat in the presence of his God. There's the man of counsel, who sat with people in all sorts of situations that we will never know about, and how in that situation revealed that God is a God of love, a God of compassion, a God who always is there for the betterment of others. Each one of us will have our memories, and they are our own. And most of them will be of a man who in some way revealed that the Lord our God is one, and we are called by our words and actions to show that to the world. There is much more of the Cardinal that we will never know, but we can be certain as he shared the same fire of God's faithful love burning in his heart with us and those who have gone before us. It is about being the best we can, even when we can't see that for ourselves. This is never about us. It is always about God. And this is the example that the Cardinal has given to us as we say goodbye, good and faithful servant. He lived here, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In the spirit of the disciples who walked along the road and talked about their experiences, let us talk and never be afraid to share the experience of God for us as Cardinal Cassidy has done and will continue to do in our hearts. We must, like the disciples, walk along the road, hold the command of our God on our hearts and impress it on our children, talk about the command when we sit at home and when we walk along the road, when we lie down and when we get up. This is what he did in his life. There is a quote from Richard Raw, which probably will have the Cardinal turning over in his coffin there, but I think is very fitting for today's funeral mass as we farewell the Cardinal. We must learn how to walk through the stages of dying. We have to grieve over lost friends, relatives, and loves. Death cannot be dealt with through quick answers, religious platitudes, or a stiff upper lip. Dying must be allowed to happen over time, in predictable and necessary stages, both in those who die graciously and in those who love them. Grief is a time where God can fill the tragic gap with something new and totally unexpected yet the process cannot be rushed. So grieve, because we need to grieve. And yes, weep, because we need to weep. He's worth every tear. This is what he did with us, and in doing so, revealed the lavish love that God has poured out upon us. This is our time, and now is the time to grieve the relationship that is no longer physically present to us, but in faith will always be with us. Rest in peace, eminence, in the embrace of our faithful and loving God.
God, the Almighty Father, raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence, we ask him to save all his people, living and dead. In baptism, Cardinal Cassidy received the light of Christ, that the risen Christ will scatter the darkness now and lead him over the waters of death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Cardinal Cassidy, who was nourished at the table of the Saviour, that Christ the King may welcome him into the halls of the heavenly banquet. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Cardinal Cassidy, who served the church as a bishop, that he may join Christ the eternal high priest and be given a place in the liturgy of heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who Cardinal Cassidy cared for during his life, especially the lonely, lost and invisible within our community, that the Lord show his mercy to those who suffer and lead them to the eternal kingdom of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who cared for Cardinal Cassidy, especially the staff of Mayfield Aged Care, the medical staff of the John Hunter Hospital, Norma Tracy, Sister Kath Williams, Marion Nadalyn and Tim O'Brien, that their works of service, love and devotion may be richly blessed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For unity amongst Christians and for stronger relationships with people of other faiths, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For ourselves assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for Cardinal Cassidy, that the Holy Spirit will strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of Christ's coming again. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, your Son Jesus has given us the hope of eternal life in you. Hear the prayers we offer for Cardinal Cassidy and grant him your lasting peace. Comfort us in our sadness and give us renewed hope. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through goodness you receive the wine we offer you, both the divine and work of your many hands, that you become our spiritual drink. <clears throat> Lord God, we ask you to receive us in peace with the sacrifice we offer you humbly and contrite hearts. Descendat super nos, misericordia tua. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrificial gifts we offer for the soul of your servant, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, that as you accorded him the pontifical dignity in this world, so you may commend him to be admitted to the company of your saints in the heavenly kingdom, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Up the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthy dwelling turns to dust, 
an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices. We offer you, firstly, for the Holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, my brother Anthony, the bishop of this church, me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which shall be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said a blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord. We, your servants, and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with the serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servant, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, who has gone before us with the sign of faith and rests in the sleep of peace. Grant him and all the faithful who have died in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Barnabas, Lucy, Agnes, Perpetua, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. We pray, almighty and merciful God, that as you have made your servant, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, an ambassador for Christ on earth, so you may raise him, purified by this sacrifice, to be seated with Christ in heaven, who lives and reigns forever and ever. May I invite now Mr. Paul Tracy to please come forward for the words of remembrance. <clears throat> Some pretty high powered people to follow here, so this will be a bit interesting, but we'll see how we go. Um, so where do we begin? The internet today provides so much information that the mystique of the career of His Eminence Cardinal Cassidy is well documented. And it's an amazing career. But to his family and friends, he will always be Uncle Bill. So I'll recount some memories today, which I think paint a picture of the man, even more than Bishop Brian already, know, already told you. So, Look, he was born in Bankstown, July 5, 1924, and died in Newcastle, April 10, 2021. Geographically, that's a very short distance, but so much was packed into the intervening 96 years. His entry into the priesthood is quite interesting, and I would say unique, and aligns a bit with your story, Archbishop because he contacted the cathedral to organise an appointment with Cardinal Gilroy to discuss his suitability. Upon attendance, he was taken by Monsignor Freeman to meet the Cardinal. Now, we hear the Lord works in mysterious ways, but this, I'm sure no one contemplated for a second that Cardinal Gilroy would be meeting with the to-be Cardinal Freeman and the to-be Cardinal Cassidy. A very high-powered job interview indeed. I guess they found him suitable. As luck and fate would have it, his first appointment was Yenda in the Riverina, predominantly Italian speaking. Bishop Hensky required someone to go to Rome to study canon law. Why not that young priest from Yenda? He knows some Italian. So off Uncle Bill went to Rome and away from Australia, apart from holidays, for 50 years. Upon receiving his doctorate from the Lateran University, he was poached by the diplomatic service of the Holy See. Bishop Hensky never did get his canon lawyer from the end up. As is mentioned, early postings were followed in India, but as an aside, his nuncio in India was to be Cardinal Knox. He had a great habit of finding friends in high places very early in his career, followed, of course, by Ireland, El Salvador and Argentina. In 1970, he was appointed nuncio to Taiwan and made an archbishop. It all happened so fast that the family found out in the paper, a very small thing in the Sydney, in the Sydney Herald, before Uncle Bill could contact us by letter. Those were the days, weren't they? He ended up being the last nuncio to Taiwan, and after a year at home, he was appointed to Bangladesh, where he's still remembered and much loved. And many are watching the live, live stream today. I've had a number of messages from Bangladesh. The year at home was an important one. It gave Uncle Bill time to catch up with his brother Doug in Newcastle and his family, nephew David and his nieces Robin and Chris. He also spent time with George and Seth and their families. Quality time was his at the holiday house in Port Stephens of his lifelong friends Jack and Dory Tracy, my grandparents. He loved his morning swim across the bay followed by another swim after his compulsory siesta. This was a lifelong habit. He also used his time in Sydney to enjoy the company of the Gold family and started a friendship with family members that continues to this day. His love of sport was obvious, with invitations to play golf, tennis, backyard cricket, and to attend rugby league games. 
Well, I must confess his choice of teams to follow, Canterbury, never initiated any changes in various other family allegiances. I did find a trophy in his home one day stating that he won the Vatican tennis doubles. It didn't have a year, I didn't say who his partner was, but I would love to know, that's quite interesting. After seven years in Bangladesh, which he absolutely loved, and I, I spent some time there with him, and responsibilities in Burma, he was appointed to South Africa. He loved the climate of South Africa because it reminded him so much of home. And he became an avid rugby fan, attending many matches in Pretoria. And of course, South Africa was followed by the Netherlands. So he'd been in Asia, he'd been in Latin America, he'd been in Africa, he'd been in Europe, so where next? Well, back to where it all began, Rome, as the Substitute Secretary of State, a bit like the Pope's Chief of Staff. Some 18 months later, he was having his daily meeting with Pope John Paul II. And they were tossing around names for who has become the President of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. The Pope said, I think I've found the right man. Uncle Bill replied, who? The Pope said, you. Much to his great shock. He was created a cardinal at the June 28, 1991 consistory. Cardinal deacon of Santa Maria in Via Lata, a beautiful church not far from the Trevi Fountain. Fantastic. Some of those who had, to, had the privilege to be there are also here today. His nephew David and wife Carol, the husband of his niece Robin, Mark, my mother Norma Tracy, my nephew Scott Wilson, John and Rowena Hennessy and the family, and Francis Ducky, who was watching this live from, from Bangladesh, and of course myself. We had a wonderful few days in Rome with Uncle Bill before the ceremony. One interesting feature of the ceremony, and it, goes, it's a, it is pretty amazing, was that we had it seat three rows in front of Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa of Calcutta. His first Mass as Cardinal was celebrated at Assisi. We all attended this most moving event. It was fantastic. Through all these appointments, though, Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill never changed. He got people. And this is exemplified by the fact that he received national awards from El Salvador, the Republic of China, the Netherlands, Italy, France, Sweden and Germany, culminating in being made a companion in the Order of Australia, our highest honour. He counted among friends, Chiang Kai-shek, Mother, now Saint Teresa, Oscar Romero, now Saint Oscar, Desmond Tutu, just to name a few, as well as many dignitaries in Australia. However, he was a friend to all through work and deed. In 1999, he decided to return to Australia and sold the home he shared with Dan and Kath Gold in Carlingford and decided to build his dream home in Newcastle, next door to his lifelong friends, Ron and Norma Tracy. His home included a beautiful chapel where he said mass every day. But appointments with the church were not over yet. A phone call from Bishop Malone, who I can see there, and an acceptance, and he was back ministering to the large Italian community in Newcastle. They loved having their own cardinal, and, they loved, and he loved being with them. Being back in Australia also enabled him to spend time with family and friends. I know how pleased he was when he, so many attended his 90th birthday, organised by David Cassidy. Uncle Bill maintained good health for much of his life and was supported particularly by Scott Wilson. How many times, Scott, did you have to change his password? Because he just didn't get what spam was on his computer. He drove his car well into his 90s. For 20 years, before he, Ron, before his death, and Norma Tracy, cared for nearly all his needs, particularly meals, and they spent much time together. They were aided by a wonderful housekeeper, Marion Nadalyn, who was here today, and Sister Kath Williams, who was a magnificent support. Unfortunately, three years ago, Uncle Bill fell during the night and broke his hip, and he lost considerable mobility, and doctors deemed that he was not able to remain in his much-loved home. Scott and I will long remember the difficult conversation telling him of this situation, and also a phone call from David helped convince him, so thanks for that too. We had been recommended Mayfield Aged Care, and luckily there was a room available. The staff there were brilliant, 
and he became the rock star resident. He settled in well and enjoyed the company of the others there. And of course, his compulsory shivers were eagle at 4 p.m. on the dot each day. He was also enhanced by the morning visit of Tim O'Brien to give him communion. When asked if Tim had been, his face beamed with happiness. It was the highlight of every day. Three weeks ago today, he fell in his bathroom suffering a compound fracture of his right leg, a terrible injury requiring surgery. He really did not fully recover from the operation and on Saturday, April 10, only moments after receiving a blessing from Mon Monsignor John Boyle, he passed away. Thank you all for being here. I know he'll be absolutely chuffed by this. Thank you, Uncle Bill, for being you. You have been an amazing constant in our lives, for always being the down-to-earth person who made everyone feel special. May you rest in peace and enjoy the eternal life you so richly deserve. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Cardinal Cassidy again and enjoy his friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Cardinal Cassidy in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, 
turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In peace, let us take our brother to his place of rest.
Idris Cardinal Cassidy has gone to his rest in the peace of Christ. May the Lord now welcome him to the table of God's children in heaven. With faith and hope in eternal life, let us assist him with our prayers. Let us pray to the Lord also for ourselves. May we who mourn be reunited one day with our brother. Together, may we meet Christ Jesus, where he who gives our life appears in glory. We read in sacred scripture, Come, you whom my Father has blessed, says the Lord. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your own three days in the tomb, you hallowed the graves of all who believe in you, and so made the grave a sign of hope that promises resurrection even as it claims our mortal bodies. Grant that our brother may sleep here in peace until you awaken him in glory, for you are the resurrection and the life. Then he will see you face to face, and in your light will see light, and know the splendour of God, for you live and reign for ever and ever. Because God has chosen to call our brother, Edward Idris, Cardinal Cassidy, from this life to himself, we commit his body to its resting place. For we are dust, and unto dust we shall return. But the Lord Jesus Christ will change our mortal bodies to be like his in glory. For he our brother to the Lord, that the Lord may embrace him in peace and raise up his body on the last day. Dear friends, our Lord comes to raise the dead and comforts us with the solace of his love. Let us praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Word of God, creator of the earth to which Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy now returns. In baptism, you called him to eternal life to praise your father forever. Lord, have mercy. Son of God, you raise up the just and clothe them with the glory of your kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Crucified Lord, you protect the soul of Cardinal Cassidy 
by the power of your cross. And on the day of your coming, you will show mercy to all the faithful departed. Lord, have mercy. Judge of the living and the dead. At your voice, the tomb will open and all the just who sleep in your peace will rise and sing the glory of God. Lord, have mercy. All praise to you, Jesus, our Savior. Death is in your hands and all the living depend on you alone. Lord, have mercy. coming of God's kingdom, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Listen, O God, to the prayers of your church on behalf of the faithful departed and grant to your servant, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, whose funeral we have celebrated today, the inheritance promised to all your saints. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Merciful Lord, you know the anguish of the sorrowful. You are attentive to the prayers of the humble. Hear your people who cry out to you in their need and strengthen their hope in your lasting goodness. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.